I turned 60 years old just a few weeks prior, and I officially retired from my job. I felt as though a hundred pounds had lifted from my shoulders, and I went home one day feeling like my life had just started. But then, as soon as I walked in through the front door, my husband said something so unbelievable it left me catatonic for multiple seconds. You're no longer of any use to me. Get the hell out of my house now. I'm married to this girl here. A younger woman, perhaps between 35 and 40 years of age, stepped from the doorway that led to the living room, and my husband put his arm around her. She had a wry smile on her face, and she passed her hand through her long, straight, brown hair, evidently emphasizing her looks. I... I don't understand. We're already divorced, right? Your darling husband just abandoned you, sweetie. Now, he's gonna be mine forever. In response to these two people for making fun of me, on top of making me miserable for so long, I had prepared a little marriage surprise that was so perfect for them both. Now, hell shall break loose. My name is Sabrina, and I'm 40 years old. I work as a caregiver, and I unfortunately don't have many friends. I can't remember the last time I had a boyfriend, to be honest. That part of my life just seems so long ago, and I frankly can't remember who my old boyfriends were. It was basically that long ago, and I've been living alone for the longest time. I don't have any hobbies, and my daily schedule for my days off consists of walking or biking along the river. But recently, I've been wondering if I would remain single for the rest of my life, and I was struck with a feeling of intense loneliness and despair. I never wanted to be alone forever, and I told myself that it's not too late. It was probably the biggest decision of my life when I made up my mind to go talk to a marriage counselor. A few weeks later, that day was the day I was going to the first matchmaking party of my life. I put on the nice, new clothes I bought just for the party. I got my hair and makeup done at a salon. I basically took drastic measures to be as glamorous as I possibly could to appear respectable to the bachelors who might be attending the party. At the venue, there were 10 men and 10 women, and the facilitator handed out something that looked like profile cards. When I took a closer look, I saw I was right. The card showed the profile picture of each participant, as well as their names, ages, and occupations. After this, men and women were to be paired up and talk to each other for 10 minutes each. This was designed in such a way as to allow a good opportunity to find someone they like and with whom they believe they hit it off. However, I have never talked with a man close to my age, and I was too nervous to talk to the first one. Even more so, actually. I couldn't even look the first person in the eye, and with the second man, I only had the courage to say hello. The allotted time flew by much more quickly than I'd thought, and I told myself I couldn't go on like this. I promised myself that with the next bachelor, I shouldn't care about anything, just freaking talk to the man. I was doing this for my own good, and I sure as hell wasn't going to let this opportunity go to waste. That's what I vowed to myself, and I faced the third person from across the table. I gathered my courage and tried to talk to him, but then, the man greeted me cheerfully. He reached out his hand to shake mine, and as he did so, he said... Nice to meet you. My name is Benjamin. Nice to meet you, Benjamin. I'm Sabrina. Sabrina? What a nice name. This is actually my first time coming to a matchmaking party like this, you see. Actually, it's my first time too, and I haven't been able to communicate well thus far. In response to my confession, Mr. Benjamin responded, So we're both on the same page. Here, I'm looking forward to getting to know you today. A sweet, charming, childlike smile spread across his face as he said so. In that moment, I noticed my tension mysteriously dissolving. After that, 
We talked about our jobs, as well as other things such as how we spend our days off. Talking with you, Miss Sabrina, is so much fun for me, and time flies by so quickly. I was thinking the same thing with you, Mr. Benjamin. Maybe, just maybe, this is what I'm destined to be with for the rest of my life. Just as I thought that, I remembered that he had his profile hanging from his neck. Upon closer inspection, I discovered he's actually ten whole years younger than me. For a moment, I was unsure about starting a relationship with him. I started to wonder if he was aware of this truth, and I was so curious about that, I decided to take the plunge and ask him. Mr. Benjamin, I thought about us being together forever, but the truth is that I'm... I'm ten years older than you. As I talk, Benjamin was just staring at me, without saying anything back to me. What do you think about me being older than you, Mr. Benjamin? I was saying these things that I myself couldn't believe. My face was bright red at this point, and covered my face with my hands. Perhaps he felt a little sympathetic when he saw me in this state, because he went and said, I don't care if you're ten years younger or twenty years older than me, Miss Sabrina. I find you very attractive, and I'd like us to keep in touch after tonight, if that's all right for you. He asked me to be his girlfriend on the premise that we would get married in the end, to which I was very grateful, and accepted very enthusiastically. We dated many times and got married a year later. At the recommendation of my new husband, I continued to work as usual as a caregiver. Let's divide up the household chores too. Can't impose it all on a woman who's working hard at her job now, can we? Per his suggestion, the housework was divided evenly between the two of us. Since I was pretty proficient in cleaning and tidying things up, I was in charge of that, and since he enjoyed cooking, he prepared the meals, as well as washing the dishes afterwards. We took turns doing the laundry, depending on the day. This made my life pretty easygoing and balanced, and I was always so grateful to be married to a man who takes initiative. Then, one day, Benjamin asked me about something important. Sabrina, honey, I'd like to have children. I don't know if it's the right time, nor do I know you feel ready to bear the child, but I just wanted to let you know, and hopefully start trying. Of course I felt the same way. I'd wanted children for such a long time, and now that I had a nice husband, I was convinced my dream would come true. From that day onward, I checked my basal body temperature every day, hoping to be physically able to get pregnant. I thought I would have been blessed with a child soon, but the reality was that I wasn't, and another year was about to pass before I realized how much time had gone on. I was curious as to why I couldn't have children, and I decided to go to the hospital. That's when I found out I was infertile. I was devastated. Benjamin, darling, the doctors say that it'll be hard for me to have a child. I'm... I'm infertile. I'm so sorry. Oh, honey. Look at me, look at me. It's alright. Infertility can be treated, and we'll get over it together. That's what he said as he hugged me tenderly. In that moment, I vowed to do my best to live up to my husband's wishes, and began the infertility treatment with a burning determination. But the infertility treatment was harder and more expensive than I had ever imagined. All of the savings I had saved up during the time I was single had reached the bottom of the barrel fairly quickly. My parents passed away when I was young, so I only had one person I could talk to, and that was my husband, Benjamin. I need to talk to you about my infertility treatment. That's what I said, and I began to explain what exactly the treatment was and how much it cost. Benjamin's jaw hit the floor when I told him just how expensive the treatment is, and he looked sympathetic when I told him that my savings had reached rock bottom. We both knew that if we didn't do something about it, I would not be able to continue the infertility treatment. I'll let you take care of the money, Sabrina, on one condition. I want you to leave all the housework to me. So just do what you think you should do to make enough to go on with the treatment. So we decided to change our roles and our responsibilities. We agreed that I take the initiative and focus on my work, 
and that's exactly what I did. I thought about what I would do after we did have children, and I started studying for certain certifications. My husband was concerned about my health, and he took care of me very well by carefully planning what each meal would be each day, and he also took care of all the housework. We supported each other like a very good team, and our lives were going well. Two more years passed in the blink of an eye. Even after that, I couldn't get pregnant, and Benjamin, who had been the kindest gentleman to ever walk into my life, had become someone very different. Around then, he always seemed to be in a bad mood, and the fact that one of his juniors at his job had been promoted to a better position than his didn't help at all. While one could always expect kind words and a soothing tone coming their way whenever he opened his mouth, once upon a time, he was now uttering sarcastic remarks about my inability to have children. It's times like these that make me think I might have been able to work harder. If only I had a child. And he would glance at me. I could do nothing but endure these little comments of his dissatisfactions with my infertility. It pained me to start to think about this, but I began to suspect that even if I did stay with him, the atmosphere would always be uncomfortable because of my situation, and I might never be happy with him again. As I thought about that, the word divorce started to take hold in my mind, but if I did divorce him, the loneliness I once felt, the same loneliness that I despised so much I resorted to matchmaking to be rid of it, was waiting for me perhaps with a vengeance. At this point in my life, I would be alone again, and that's the last thing I wanted. I chose not to get divorced, and to endure and get over it. The years pass by like bullets through air, and I just turned 60 a few weeks ago prior. My marriage was at its worst. I don't talk to my husband anymore. Still, I thought I would spend the rest of my life with him. A few days later, Today, I retired from my years of service in the caregiving industry and clutching the letter of congratulations from all my colleagues and a bouquet of flowers, I went home. When I arrived, Benjamin, who had gotten home before me, stared at me. It was as though I was doing something wrong, but he didn't say anything. I felt I had no choice but to talk to him myself. I retired today. My friends at work kindly gave me this bouquet of flowers. Then, for the first time in years, I heard my husband's voice as he spoke to me directly. What are you going to do tomorrow? Well, let's see. I'm not so young anymore, so I'm thinking of just staying at home and maybe thinking of a hobby to pursue. When he heard this, my husband went on to say something so unbelievable it left me catatonic for multiple seconds. Do you really think that an infertile piece of shit like you is going to be fricking allowed to live under my roof? Now that you're out of a job, you're no longer of any use to me. Get the frick out of this house now. These past 20 years have been a goddamn waste of my fricking time. I was so surprised I just stood there, unable to speak. Benjamin's ranting did not stop. I married you because I thought we both wanted the same things in life, especially children. And yet you couldn't have children, and you didn't do shit to try and fix that. Our entire marriage was nothing but a scam, and the freaking scammer is you. As alimony, I'll be taking half of your fortune and your severance pay. Then we might be even. What do you mean alimony? With a smirk on his face, he went on to say, I already divorced you, you see. I don't remember signing anything that looked like a divorce document. I don't need your signature for a divorce. The divorce papers have already been filed, and it was finalized about a month ago. I'll get the frick out of my house. So basically, my now ex-husband had falsified my signature on the divorce papers and submitted it to City Hall. Did he really think that was acceptable? You don't understand anything, do you? What do you think my husband did when he heard me say that? If you thought he would ask me what I meant by that, you are unfortunately mistaken. What he actually did was smirk menacingly, rub his hands together, and replied, No, Sabrina, you're the one who doesn't know what's going on. 
Unlike your old bitch ass, I'm still only 50 years old, young, sprightly, and charming. And you know what that means. I'm going to start my life over. If you don't understand what I mean by that, so be it. You've proven to me you're as stupid as you look. If you understand, I applaud you, and I hope you applaud me back, because this great reset of my life is going to be the best and happiest decision I'll ever make. Now don't make me say this again. Get the frick out of my house. You say you're still young, sprightly, and charming, but lest we forget, you're 50 years old, Benjamin. You're far from the young man you once were. I had had enough of my husband's disgusting selfishness, and I decided to leave the house, just as he told me to. I went to my bedroom and started packing my things. From the living room, I could hear my husband talking on the phone with someone. I wouldn't be surprised if he was bragging about his divorce. I just wanted to get away from someone who'd done such a terrible thing to me. The fact that this was the man I married made the packing pretty hard, as vision was blurred by my overflowing tears. I packed what I could bring with me as quick as I could. I just wanted to get the hell out of this hell. And then, I heard the doorbell ring. I could feel the presence of a guest, but I was already leaving this house, and I was now divorced from Benjamin, so it was none of my business. I grab my bags and stride into the living room. That's where I discovered a woman sitting on the couch with a travel bag at her feet. Benjamin was also there, sitting on the couch right next to her. The two of them were talking amicably, and I immediately understood what this meant. When he realized that I was watching him, another evil grin spread across his face and said, I already married this girl, Sabrina. Her name is Valerie and she's everything to me. His head tilted back, and I could see his hairs protruding from the inside of his nose as he cackled manically. I felt sick to my stomach at the sight of what had once been my loving husband. I tried my hardest to suppress my anger, and I asked him, So you divorced me because you wanted to marry this woman? Is that what this is all about? Then, the woman looked at me in such a state of near-exploding fury, and burst out laughing. Sweetie, your face is more terrifying than that of a rotting zombie. I'm pretty sure that face is exactly why your darling husband left you. Benjamin nodded his head in agreement and piled on the verbal abuse. You're the kind of bitch who deserves to be thrown away. I don't even know why I ever married you in the first place, but I guess I should also thank you, because without you, I never would have met the love of my life. They stare at me for a couple of seconds, a smug twinkle in their eyes, and then they laughed together as if they were proud of themselves for this triumphant moment. Of course, I agree. I'm a woman who deserves to be thrown away. I don't know why you ever married me either. But I have to say, life with you was pretty nice in the beginning. So you already married this girl? Well, congratulations. I'll get you a nice wedding present, and I'll make sure to give it to you soon. Is what I said that as I left the house... Needless to say, in this moment, I promised myself I would exact my revenge on them both. I stayed in a hotel for a while before finding a nice apartment to rent and started living alone again. I went to my former job, and I talked to the matron of the establishment, who agreed to let me work there for a little while. This allowed me to secure an income for the time being, and I was finally ready to prepare for my revenge against them. I hired a detective agency for an investigation into my husband's infidelity, and I also hired a lawyer to help me with all the formalities of the real divorce. I did whatever I could to help me get the most satisfying revenge I could possibly conjure. I was not accustomed to the administrative processes that came with what I had planned to destroy them, and I was at a loss at times. But then I imagined the look on their faces when they went to hell and that ignited the flame of determination to do whatever it took to get what I wanted. I could do anything, no matter how hard it was, and I did do everything within a few short weeks. Then, a few weeks after everything was arranged, I got a call from my ex-husband. The first thing I heard was a yell of outrage. What do you mean you're demanding freaking a hundred grand in alimony? I already divorced you, you stupid you must have gone batshit crazy. 
Oh my, such rude words, Mr. Benjamin Holbrook. You're the one who's gone crazy, it seems. You still don't realize what crime you committed, do you? My husband continues to yell at me through the phone. I don't know what crime you're freaking talking about. You're not gonna freaking get away with this, Sabrina. Trying to get alimony from me. The sheer audacity. You're freaking wasting your time. Drop these demands right now, or I swear to frick I'll sue you for defamation. When I heard that, I thought it was so funny that I couldn't keep myself from laughing. And I laughed hard. Like, I was actually bent over, wheezing and crying. I was laughing so hard I was afraid I would pass out. The fact that I laughed at him made him even angrier. Oh, think I'm an idiot, do you? Oh, no, no. You got it all wrong, my good sir. I'm not making fun of you. I'm just surprised you know a difficult word like defamation. That was a laugh showing I was impressed. Shut your freaking hole right now. I knew you were making fun of me. I could actually hear him breathing heavily through the phone. So in response to my ex-husband's behavior, I decided to calmly tell him a certain truth. Since you think you're so smart, would you mind telling me what document falsification means? Documentary? What, what the frick does that even mean, damn it? Refresh my memory here. Did you tell me that you pretended to be me in order to get both sections of the divorce documents filled in and stamped? In other words, you impersonated someone else in order to file for something they never authorized, and you hence falsified the information on the document. That's what document falsification is in a nutshell. And I'll clue you in on another thing. It's a federal crime. Those two words, federal crime, made my ex-husband react in such a way that I just knew he broke out in a cold sweat. Oh, come now. You don't have to make such a big deal of it, and call it something that's clearly way out of proportion. Counterfeiting official documents is punishable by penal servitude lasting between three months and five years. You sure want to do this? Think about Valerie. My ex-husband, after hearing all this, got furious once again, for some reason, and said, You're the one who started my unhappiness, now you're trying to turn me into a criminal. How dare you call yourself a human? Show some mercy at least. I did what I thought we both wanted. Falsifying divorce documents, having an affair behind my back, and kicking me out of the house on my retirement wasn't on the list of things I wanted, I'll be honest with you. And if I sue you on grounds for document falsification, you'll be deemed a criminal by the jury. I'm suggesting another way to settle this situation. And that's by you paying me a hundred grand as alimony, because the last thing wants to be called is a horrible person. My ex-husband fell silent at that. And you want to know why I know you were having an affair? Because I hired a detective agency to look into that, and lo and behold, they found so much evidence of you being with her, I know that you met her at a cabaret. And then my ex-husband did the unthinkable. As though nothing had happened, he started to take the offensive. That's right. As you know from your research, I was actually having an affair. I confess to it. But I'll have you know that adultery is not a crime. Sucks to suck. Couldn't be me for real, for real. Oh my god. I wondered if Benjamin's stupidity knew any bounds. I found myself ashamed to have ever loved someone as heartless and as brainless as this inhuman bag of slewer slime. He seemed to still be under the impression that he was in the right. You're right. Adultery is not a federal crime, but you can still sue someone if you want to. Look like she's gonna have to pay me alimony too. As for the house and our joint savings, I'll be taking half of them both as fair division of property. I suggest you prepare yourself for the onslaught, Mr. Holbrook. No, no, no wait a minute, P please. He was just about to say something, but I interrupted him by saying this as a parting shot. This is my wedding gift to you, as promised. You keep your end of the bargain and take it, okay? I spent so much time and money on getting you this gift. I hung up the phone immediately afterwards. I couldn't actually see the pain on their faces, which was admittedly disappointing, but I'm happy with the way things turned out.
A few days later, the lawyer I'd hired told me that my ex-husband had agreed to pay alimony on his wife's behalf, as well as his own. After that, she filed for divorce herself, blackmailing Benjamin with his crime of document falsification into signing his section of the document, and she later moved out of the house. As a result of this, he's asking me to reduce the amount of alimony for his second wife, but there was no way that was a valid reason to reduce the amount, and he's now living alone in a small apartment, working hard from dawn till dusk, to pay me his debts and monthly deposits. As for me, after working as a caregiver for a while, the old age was starting to get to me, physically, so the matron of the establishment introduced me to an office job, and as of now, I'm working as a desk clerk. When I was younger, I passed the exams needed to become a certified bookkeeper and secretary, so the fact that my current work is supported by decent bookkeeping and secretarial skills makes it easier for me as well as for the firm and pays a lot better. I used to be afraid of being single again, but when I started to live on my own, I found that this kind of lifestyle suited me. From now on, I'm going to enjoy living alone as a free, single woman and dedicate myself to my desk work and my newfound hobby of playing the ukulele. I'm going to live my life as full as it can be, and I hope I make many friends along the way.